You're listening to Speaking Sidemount, the podcast where we talk all things sidemount diving, from equipment, skills, techniques, and sidemount diving expeditions, to interviews with some of the world's top sidemount divers. Whether you're new to sidemount, been sidemount diving for years, or just want to know more, this is the place for all things sidemount. I'm your host, Steve Davis. Let's get wet. Welcome back to Speaking Sidemount. I'm Steve Davis. Well, it's been a busy past month with my cave diving trip to Mount Gambia, South Australia, done and dusted. It set back my production schedule some, but it was every bit as good as I'd been hoping, and we achieved so much in just 12 days of diving. I'm working up an episode on Mount Gambia and our experiences there, and I hope to have that out to you over the next couple of months. I also have some brilliant guests lined up for our next episode, so I'm buzzed to be able to keep bringing you quality content on side mount and diving in general. Thanks all for your continued support and the many positive comments that I receive. It means so much, and I really do appreciate you sharing the podcast and Facebook posts as this helps to grow our audience and expose the benefits of side mount to more divers. Thanks also to XDeep for their amazing support of me and the podcast. I'm truly honored to work with them and appreciate their support in helping me invest the time and effort in producing this podcast. Now, I'm sure you know by now that I'm passionate not just about side mount, but also about optimizing our equipment and dive practices to be efficient in the water. We can learn a lot about efficiency by watching marine life and especially marine mammals. How and why they are so fast and efficient in the water is a question we should all ask. Obviously, they're amazingly streamlined, but not just in terms of their body shapes, but also how they move their bodies in the water. Think about how and where we apply this as human beings. Look at Olympic level competitive swimmers, for instance, or a top level competitive freediver. They train for hours per day, not just to improve their swimming, but also to improve their technique. They strive relentlessly to be streamlined. Why, you might ask? So that they can minimize drag and therefore the work that's required to move them through the water. They are either faster in the case of a swimmer or more relaxed in the case of a freediver. So let's think about how we can apply this to scuba diving. As side mount divers, we know that it's really important to be streamlined and have all of our cylinders aligned with our body and therefore our direction of travel. And more than that, We know how to do this with tools as simple as loop bungees, sliding D-rings, and a waist strap that is the correct position on our body. And this remains true regardless of whether we're diving two cylinders, six cylinders, some combination of steel or aluminium cylinders. I continue to be amazed at the number of even very experienced and capable backmount open circuit and rebreather divers who don't seem to understand this important principle. They sling their deco, stages, and bailouts and they are simply not aligned to their bodies. They move independently of the diver, and they're absolutely not streamlined and efficient. And then when you look at how they look to overcome this, they simply add a DPV to give them more power. Now, nothing against DPVs. They're brilliant tools, and they open up a world of diving where great distances can be covered. But with this increased speed, streamlining should be even more important. So when I saw some images taken by Marissa Eckert of James Draker deep backmount rebreather diving in Little Cayman, I took note. James's bailout was perfectly side mounted, trimmed to his body, and he was as streamlined as he could possibly be. I reached out to Marissa and James, and they are my guests for this episode. We talk about their background, about their dive center hidden worlds in Fort White, Florida, about their approach to side mount, cave training, and dive equipment. And then we discuss the X-Deep Stealth 2.0 and why we prefer to dive it, the merits of being able to use steel and aluminium cylinders, and then we go into one of their real passions, one that I share with them, and that is dive travel. We talk about Abaco, about Mexico, Little Cayman, and the upcoming trip to Order Cave in Russia. Somehow they twist my arm and get the scoop on my recent trip to Mount Gambia, and then we talk cave exploration and close circuit rebreather diving. All this and much, much more in this episode of Speaking Sidemount. Hey, Marissa James, welcome to Speaking Sidemount. Hey, thank you for having us. You're most welcome. So it's great to have you both join us. I've known of you for quite a long time, and between your travel and your work and my travel and my work, it's been hard to pull this (laughs) off, so I'm really glad that we could catch up. Before you go away again, and we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later, so, and this is my first time that I've done an interview with two people at once, so let's see how this goes. 
Sounds good. Great. Okay, so I always start with a little bit about background. So I'll let you guys tag team as much as you like, but I'm really interested in learning more about both of your backgrounds. Uh, so I went on a vacation trip to the Maldives about 12 years ago and did an open water class. Well, first I did a Discover Scuba, and after the Discover Scuba, I got out of the water and said I want to be a scuba instructor. From that day on, I pretty much dove any opportunity I got, and I lived in Pennsylvania at the time. Mm -hmm. So I was diving in quarries and lakes and I didn't care. Like I just wanted to be under the water. And right. then I had a friend, she signed up for a cavern class in the Florida Springs. And I really had no idea what that meant, but I was going to be her buddy and I was going to come here. So I came here, did some of my first cavern dives, came out of the class and said, I want to teach cave diving. <laughs> I went back to Pennsylvania, sold everything I had, came here, didn't know anybody and uh, moved here a month later. And I've lived here ever since. Yeah, it's amazing. And I hear that a lot from my interview guests where they go on a holiday, do a dive and then say, hey, this is me. And next thing you know, it turns their life right upside down and they change direction completely. Yeah, I had no idea places like this existed in the United States. Water is beautiful and it's clear and amazing as the springs and mm -hmm. cave diving is kind of like a final frontier and it's, you can feel like an explorer and see things that so few people have ever seen and it's just yep. amazing. So yep. yeah, that's kind of how I got into it. Yeah, I don't think any of us really realize how much this sport can just suck you in right mm. from the start. Uh, I started uh, recreational open water certified when I was 13, uh, dived all through my teenage years. And by the time I was 20, I was a paddy recreational instructor. Mm -hmm. And in, in college, uh, age uh, 20 to 23, I worked part time for IANTD. Mm -hmm. I actually did uh, nitrox training and the nitrox instructor training with Dick Rutkowski down in the Florida Keys. Right. Who introduced me to Tom and Patty, Patty Mount uh, up in Miami. And so it was Tom Mount who took me on my first tech dive and took me on my first cave dive. And you know, he would just say, James, we're going to go do this thing today. Do you want to join us? And of course, when someone like that says, hey, let's, let's go do this amazing dive, you, you just go and you do it. Exactly. And I didn't have any idea what I was getting into or what the diving was going to be. Uh, when he brought me up here to the High Springs area to go cave diving for the first time, uh, I was actually the, the guinea pig. He was working with some cave instructors. And so my introduction to cave diving was not cavern and intro level. It was just put on a set of double tanks and let's go. And let's, mm -hmm. let's do it. At the time, I was uh, living and working down in, uh, in Miami. And just over the years, constantly just trying to get myself closer to this area. So I've, I've lived in Orlando over the years. I've lived in mm -hmm. Jacksonville over the years. Uh, I've worked for uh, manufacturers like Halcyon and, and Light Monkey, uh, mm -hmm. Scuba Force. Uh, I've managed dive shops and been an instructor for over 20 years. Uh, and just you know, continue to, to have that passion and, and continue to want to you know, share what we love to do with as many people as possible. Yeah, and I hear that a lot. You just get the bug. I remember myself, Jacques Cousteau in the 70s. I remember watching that show and saying, I want to be Albert Falco, you know, and then I didn't even know how to scuba then. It was only like between four and seven at that age. Later on, when I got a chance to put on a, an old J valve cylinder and put myself underwater, you know, just going down a meter or two it was about one meter visibility. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, you really can breathe underwater. Until that point, it was hard to believe it was true. It took me a few years to get certified after that. But once I was certified in the early 80s, it was, didn't have the same opportunity to change careers because I joined the Navy. And so military had me at that point. But it was mm -hmm. still uh, really cool to be able to do it in my spare time. And so I understand completely. So from those beginnings, you both got into cave diving. Tell us a little bit about cave diving and perhaps weave some side mount into there too, because obviously side mount and cave diving go together and that's what the subject of this podcast is. So how did you both get into cave diving? Marissa, you mentioned your cavern dive and James, you're sort yeah. of in the deep end. So how did that all work out? Yeah, so I signed up for a cavern class with a dive shop in Pennsylvania and came mm -hmm. here and did my cavern class, was hooked. I moved here and I worked at Jenny Springs for a little while and then I managed a dive shop for a couple years. I worked at Light Monkey for a brief amount of time as well and I got an annual pass at Jenny Springs and I went there every night and I just learned the cave and I dived and dived and dived nonstop and then I started going to Mexico and you know very quickly you're like okay I want to see something new something different. So I started out in back mount doubles and learned to cave dive in doubles. In some ways, it's easy because it's a very simple configuration, but very quickly I realized, oh, I want to go into smaller places, or I want to feel more self-sufficient, mm -hmm. or I want to hike through the jungle in Mexico and see this really cool tiny hole. And so very quickly I realized, okay, I need to learn side mount. And so I kind of 
taught myself a little bit and struggled with some things mm -hmm. and then spent some time with different people. And then once I figured it out, I just fell in love with side mount and back mount is a great tool for diving off a boat, but I feel so comfortable in the water in the cave and side mount. I don't wouldn't want to dive any other configuration if I didn't have to. <laughs> sure. Now I hear you. How about you, James? You know, starting to learn to cave dive in the mid nineties, everything was back mount, but mm -hmm. there was this slow movement, this slow progression, this transition uh, certainly around here, some of the explorers were finding new leads and exploring new tunnels and going to new areas that required side mount configuration. But there really weren't any off-the-shelf side mount options out there. You had to build your own. You had to make your own. You know, I know a lot of that uh, came out of the, the sump divers over in the UK. Sure. I remember reading up and, and uh, messaging with, and I forget the gentleman's name, but the, the dragon side mount harness. Okay. Remember the dragon? I don't. Yeah. I, I actually heard it, but I don't remember it because I actually didn't even know Sideman existed in those years. So, yeah, I hear you. Was, you know, it was it was late '90s, and you're 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 piecing things together, and there's a lot of a lot of inner tube and a lot of bungee mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of you know seatbelt webbing and, and those you know things of that nature. Right. And uh, for me, the, the first time it really became practical was uh, when the Armadillo came out. Right. Uh, Right, Kurt Bone and, and Brett Hemphill and Vance Diver Magazine. You're flipping through there, and suddenly you go, "Oh, look! Here's this thing out of the box. I can pay somebody, and they can ship me something, and I can take it out of the box, and I can go side mount diving." And you know, my, my side mount tutorial was the little two-page leaflet that came with this yeah. side mount harness. And you put a tank here, and you put a tank there, and a can band here, and a can band there, and and loop bungees, and, and away you go. You know, a lot of trial and error, and a lot of experimentation. But suddenly, there was just this whole new world of cave and tunnels and new options and places you couldn't fit before, and yeah. just this new freedom of being able to go and and explore. You know, areas that before were, were off the map and they were out of reach and being able to get to new areas. Hmm. We dove a lot of back mount for a while too, but then I said, <laughs> oh, if you go back to side mount, I can show you all kinds of new caves. Cool. Once yeah. he started really diving side mount again, he fell in love with it. And yeah, I hear you. <laughs> the other transition that happened about that same time, right, as you're looking at, you know, wanting to go new places and getting in, you know, really using side mount as the tool and utilizing it for new areas and new avenues was as more and more side mount rebreathers became available. Mm -hmm. And to me, when I first looked into diving rebreathers, before I had any interest in diving a back mount rebreather, I thought if I ever got a rebreather, it's going to be a side mount rebreather. Mm -hmm. There were just certain areas, the, the back of Ginny Springs, for example, and the back of certain caves that you thought, well, the reason that no one has been back there, no one has explored back there, is just because of the constraints of open circuit. Mm -hmm. And having different options with side mount rebreathers, the technology that's come so far, along with meshing and molding that with just this technique of side mount has really opened up so many new areas for us to go to and so many new things to explore and so many more places to go. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. And so there's that thing of, uh, number one, the size of the cave. I've just come back from Mount Gambier and there was three of us who were in the advanced side mount group who went over to do the crossover and one of the guys was on a rebreather. He dives an AP and within a day he changed to side mount uh, open circuit. <laughs> Uh, yeah. For no other reason than he just simply couldn't go where we could go. And, it, and I'm not even talking about pushing through restrictions. I'm just talking about swimming through narrow cave and uh, low bedding planes and so on. So, I mean, I was super impressed with him as well because he just threw the AP off, put a couple of cylinders on and very, very experienced diver. I mean, he's a hundred meter plus CCR diver, but it was really cool to watch him do that. And then we had so much fun. The only way you could do these caves is really inside mount. So then of course the CCR thing. Yeah, there was a lot of areas at the backs of the caves where realistically to go and look at those areas, you had staging cylinders and it's a big operation over multiple dives to be able to get to the back safely and return again. And absolutely, you know, CCR starts to open that up. And if it's a side mount cave or a cave you really want to look after, even from the point of view of the cave itself. Circulation and bubbles. And yeah. yeah. You've got the time. You've got uh, an opportunity to look around. You don't mm -hmm. feel rushed. You don't feel hurried. You don't have the bubbles and, and the percolation that are silting things out. So when you've got the right equipment configuration and the right tools and equipment to do the job, it really makes a tremendous difference. Yeah, sure. I've got a lot of areas I want to go into, but I can see in your <laughs> shop there, this looks awesome at the back. So tell us a little bit about Hidden Worlds and how that all came about. You're in Fort White, Florida, right? Yeah, we're, yeah, we're in Fort White. We're so, in it's all my fault. <laughs> I, I decided a few years ago that I've been teaching for several years and I was working a, you know, a full-time day job teaching weekends and evenings and taking days off and holidays and, and James was working for, for uh, Scuba Force USA and, mm -hmm. and I just couldn't sit in a cubicle anymore and I was like, I want to do this full-time. 
So I quit my job and started teaching full time. And James like, oh, well, there's this place for rent right around the corner and we could have our own little classroom. And I liked being my own boss and I liked not having to worry too much about being here and I could travel yeah. when I wanted to. Yeah. But it's been a blessing. I mean, we've had a lot of success and it's really nice to have our own space to sit down with students and do classroom work and a table mm -hmm. to set up gear. And we always have everything in stock that we need to help right. set up our students for success to get them, you know, all the little random pieces of hardware and the mm -hmm. X deeps, like a lot of stuff that other shops around here just don't carry. It's been pretty amazing. And we, we set this up around what we wanted and the way that we dive and the style that we teach with and Mm -hmm. The key focus was for us to have a professional training facility, mm -hmm. nice, clean, quiet place where we can sit down with students and really be able to work with them in the environment that we wanted to be able to train them with. And then, of course, from there, you've got new cavern students, new side mount students, new cave students. They need bits and bobs, right? They need reels and spools and mm -hmm. lights and those sorts of things. And we wanted to make sure we had all of that available to our students. Mm -hmm. And all of the gear and the equipment that we carry and we stock are the things that we actually use or the things yep. and the brands the products that we believe in. So when you walk into our shop, you won't see one of every manufacturer that's out there. You, you look at the stuff that we're diving, you look at the stuff that's on the walls here, and that's what, that's what we offer. Yeah. Uh, we believe in the products that we have. We believe we've got the best products and the things that we offer. And there are yeah. things that when we're 3,000 feet back in a cave, when we're 100 meters deep in a cave, when we're done, we've got four hours of decompression ahead of us. These are the things that, that our lives are dependent upon, and that's the equipment that we're offering and selling and providing yeah. to our students. I was talking to Bart and Peter at X Deep, yes. and I said, you know, you walk in here, and you're only going to find X Deep in here. I'm not mm -hmm. going to offer five different side mount harnesses because I genuinely believe that the X Deep is by far the best side mount harness out there right now, the design mm -hmm. of it and everything. Mm -hmm. I put students in that harness, and they immediately trim out. They have lift where they need it. They yep. can get to things. We're not going to sell 20 different things. We're not here to try to make money. We're here to make good divers. I was about to say, I absolutely love that because I kind of have exactly the same attitude. Again, in Mount Gambier, I'm diving with some guys diving different harnesses and, and look, they were fantastic divers and they were making those harnesses and BCDs work. And he was sort of saying, hey, you know, X-Deep sponsors your podcast. That's why you're diving X-Deep. I said, no, <laughs> it's absolutely the wrong way around. It's actually the, quite the converse of that. I've been diving yeah. deep for six years and I wanted them to be a sponsor because I love their product. Yeah. And I love it so much. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I'm very happy to support them. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know for me, their system and their harness was a game changer. Mm -hmm. uh, four or five years ago, I was doing some deep exploration in Eagle's Nest. A lot of stages, a lot of bottles, but they were all very light, a mm -hmm. lot of helium, 65, 70% helium. And mm -hmm. I was looking for a harness that could handle all of those things, but also needed to be able to uh, integrate enough weight, a weight system that would work for what I was doing. Yeah. And that was what I went looking for was a system where I wasn't zip tying and bunging and flipping off weight to random places. Mm -hmm. And of course you get to the X deep and it's got this spine pouch. You can put the weight higher, lower, more here, less there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then as you're going from a wetsuit to a dry suit, from, from a rebreather to open circuit, from freshwater to saltwater, it kept adapting. And one harness does all of that for me. I don't have to choose you know, am yeah. I going to dive this one today or that one tomorrow? Because the same harness just does it all. You know, and in the moment that I put one on, it was like, wow, so this is what side mount diving really should feel like. I'm not struggling to keep things up and hold things down and move things over and shift this way. It puts the lift where you want it. You've got the options with the weight pouches. It's got all the clips and the buckles and the accessories where they should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been going to Mount Gambia. I've been diving salt water for so long. So it was so cool for me to get back into fresh water, you know, but it was... Uh, you, rinsed, you rinsed everything off. Yeah, we're well, you know what? We water and we get in there and we're like, oh. <laughs> well, the, the funny thing is we're going into some pretty gnarly places. So my gear has never been so dirty, it's covered in mud <laughs> and so on. But it was awesome. But back to the, the setup, I really made no change. The only thing I changed is I went from seven or just under seven kilos of weight to three kilos of weight. And that was the only change I made. You know, I was still diving steel cylinders. It all worked for me. I could have dived aluminum or aluminium if I wanted to, but yeah, everything works. And I find that other thing too, where I'm going to the tropics and where we go doesn't have steel cylinders. You, know, you just put aluminums on. Yeah, you need sliding D-rings. Everything locks in and that's perfect. So I love it for that. Yeah, reason. but you're able to use sliding D-rings, you know, with an H-style sure. harness. It's not that simple anymore. No, so you no. try to explain that to people and they don't, mm -hmm. you know, you come here and learn to cave dive or learn to side mount dive. A lot of instructors are only going to teach you steel cylinders because that's what we're using. 
Yep. But I try to teach all my students how to dive aluminums as well because I want to make them a well-rounded cave diver where they can go anywhere in the world and utilize yep. the equipment that they have available to them. Oh, you might yep. only have two standard valves. What do you do in that situation? You might only have aluminum on. tanks. What do you do? I want to prepare them for any kind of environment. Yeah, yeah, spot on. I talked about this before, but when I came back from Mexico where I did my side mount course and initial cave training, I was living in California. So I went into Monterey into about... 10 Celsius. So what's that? 50 something degrees, I guess, Fahrenheit. And, uh, and I thought, oh, I'll try some steel. So I threw some steels on. It was horrible, horrible. <laughs> and there was no one around to help me over there, you know, so I kind of had to figure yep. it out for myself. It took me about 20 dives or so to get it right. But once I got it right, then I think, okay, now I know, but it would be fun to come out of a course with, the, with that knowledge, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, we, we know that when a student comes to us, you know, we ask them what their ultimate goal is. Where are they mm-hmm. going to dive? What, sort of, mm-hmm. what style do they hope to achieve? Where do they want to be successful? We want to set them up for you know, success both in the course that we're taking with us here as well as the environments that they're going to dive in yeah. wherever their travels might take them. Mm-hmm. And you know, with the right equipment, with the right harness, with the right mentality and the right training, you, mm-hmm. know, you can prepare someone for virtually all of that. They're still going to have to go experience some of those things for themselves. But yep. you can you know, get them moving in the right direction so that they're not discovering and, and struggling all on their own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, yeah. And the, the one thing that takes, though, is time, right? Two days side mount course, can't achieve that in two days, right? Well, there's one guy, actually, I took a CCR instructor through, and he was fantastic. But I'm pretty sure he was having me on. I think he dived side mount before. Yeah, normally it takes a few days to get it right to make sure they're dialed in and then give yeah. them the opportunity to learn Especially something. Especially with aluminum, teaching somebody with aluminum tanks and mm-hmm. feeling where the tanks are against your body and sliding them yeah. forward appropriately, but not too far forward and feeling yeah. that. That, yeah. I get why it takes a lot of time to teach somebody side mount with aluminum tanks. It's mm-hmm. challenging because you want to go in the cave and you don't want to damage or impact the cave. You want to be clean and streamlined. Yeah. You want to look like a good, competent, safe intelligent diver you know yeah yeah <laughs> we talk about that a lot because you look at pictures of side mount divers around the world and some people look fantastic other people not so much and the one thing that we've got to be really careful of is some of the world's best explorers aren't particularly concerned <laughs> with how they look yeah. in the water right they're much more concerned with i've got to pass the sump a little bit further up yeah. so actually i'm not wearing necessarily a traditional side mount harness i'm wearing a climbing harness and a sump diving harness and that doesn't allow optimization. So I think we have to be careful about if somebody's getting it wrong in a really simple environment where they should have it right, that's different. The guy who took us in Australia for our crossover was a super experienced diver, fantastic guy. He didn't look the same as us. He was set up different, the yeah. old school, and, but it was a lot of fun diving with him, that's for sure. Yeah, we get a lot of people from Canada and they're used mm-hmm. to dry gloves and mm-hmm. struggling with bolt snaps. So they come here and they don't want to clip off their long hose because they don't do that in the quarry in the cold water. I'm like, no, you have to clip off your long hose, you know, so yeah, it's, yeah. It's different environments are challenging. But yeah. then too, you got to realize when you see somebody that doesn't look the best, maybe they didn't have the best instruction. Mm-hmm. Maybe they don't know any better. Mm-hmm. You know, unfortunately, we see a lot of bullying and stuff in this community and making fun of people. But instead, we need to stop and just try to educate people. A yeah. lot of people don't know what they don't know. And if you don't try to communicate with them, they're never going to learn. So I'm very against the bullying mentality and making fun of people because I don't think that's helping anybody. Yeah. So yeah. We, we like to show people how they look at the beginning of a course and then explain to them how we can, where we can progress with them and how they can look at, at the end of the course. Yeah. We want someone to, to understand the value and the benefit. It's not just about looking good, right? Mm-hmm. It's about why looking good is beneficial, so yeah. right? Yeah. Being streamlined and, and not having a bunch of clutter and not having danglies and not having things that are going to impact the cave, things that are going to help them throughout their dive. That's about being streamlined and being uh, everything configured in, in the right manner. Uh, yeah. So that means looking good. So uh, we want people to take pride in, in how they look and understand that there is a benefit to them and yep. how they come across. Yeah. yeah. It's not just doing it because it's the way I do it or I told you to do it that way. It's the why and the how behind it mm-hmm. so that when you're on your own, you can think the process through and go, oh yeah, that's why she was such a heckler about clipping off my long hose because when I'm in that small side mount passage, my clip isn't getting caught and snagging the line or dragging mm-hmm. across the floor of the cave. It's not just mm-hmm. me being mean or difficult. It's me wanting you to be the best, safest diver and me knowing that once I certify you, you're going to go out there and be safe. I hear. And that brings me to one of my sort of pet projects, I guess, if you want to call it on that, is educating back mount divers on the benefits of streamlining stages and decompression cylinders. And 
what motivated me, I mean, I've known you guys for a while. I was always going to reach out, but I saw you guys in Cayman and I saw those <laughs> pictures of you, James. I think you had a back mount rebreather on, but your bailout was mounted perfectly. You were streamlined, looked good, yeah, but thinking about moving through the water, even though you, oh, yeah. you had a lot of equipment on, I'm assuming they were quite deep dives as well. It was just fantastic. So I keep having this conversation where I'm talking to back mount divers and rebreather divers and I'm seeing them with near vertically mounted bailouts <laughs> because they're slung. And I keep saying, hey, listen, wouldn't it be better to do it this way? And yet they're so wrapped up in their old way of doing things that they don't seem to be able to see it. Now, I don't have the experience that you guys have with that. So I'm really interested in learning or, or hearing what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, but you're a side mount diver. So you, mm -hmm. you could use the application that you've learned to side mount dive and apply that to your bailout. It's so mm -hmm. simple. The problem is that a lot of people that dive back mount for breathers have no side mount experience. Right. So they don't know any different. You know, we spend at least a day configuring and going over, you know, how to properly mount your bailout bottles for people on rebreathers so that they don't look like you see often with the bottles sticking up. And, you know, last year when we were in Cayman for the same event for this really awesome rebreather event called Inner Space, you know, we had people like, oh, how, how do you have your bottles like that? You guys should do like a workshop, like right? Little, like demo workshop. workshop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, well. We always want to look the best because if you look competent on a dive boat, then they're going to allow you to, to do the diving that you want to do because they know they don't have to worry about you. So I don't understand the desire to just fling bottles on and who cares how you look because it just doesn't seem safe to me. Well, you know, I even think they kind of see it as a badge of honor. You know, I've got so many cylinders on me and, and they're mounted like this and it's always the way it's been done. I think they don't think that they look bad. I think they think they look good. And this is the problem, you know. It's, I think that's partly the, set, the shame of it all is they, they yeah. think they look cool. They think they look good. Yeah. And they, they think, oh, look, I've accomplished this challenge. Mm -hmm. and really, the, the challenge would be mounting the cylinders properly so that they're streamlined. To do it and look good. So they, <laughs> they, they look good. They're not banging and clanging all over the place or pressed mm -hmm. up against the body. There's not additional drag. You're not having to move yourself and all of these hanging floating bottles through the water with you. Plus, heaven forbid you need to bail out and use that gas. If it's in a nice, clean, streamlined, snug configuration with your body, you're going to know right where that equipment is versus mm -hmm. if it's moving all over the place and dragging and hanging. How easy is it going to be for you to find it in an emergency? Mm -hmm. you know, and the reality of it, the system is not hard or difficult. If you've taken two or three days worth of side mount, open circuit side mount course with aluminum cylinders, you understand how sliding D-rings work and you understand mm -hmm. how loop bungees work. You mm -hmm. understand how to flip a, a bolt snap off. You know, that's all we're doing is we're taking that open circuit side mount technique and applying it to rebreather side mount bailout strategy. Yep. And so whether someone has 1555 or 1265 on, on one side for a deep bailout and 50% nitrox as a, as a deco gas bailout for something shallower, you can still have those bottles positioned alongside your body. The mm -hmm. 1555 acts like a, a cylinder that's two-thirds empty, and mm -hmm. the 50% acts like a cylinder that's full, and you know how to position those directly. You feel where it lines up on your body, and you move the sliding D-ring forward, and you know, sure. that's where you keep it then. Something else I hear is, I mean, number one, they're, because they're so inefficient in the water, they're often using DPVs so that they can move around because swimming creates yeah. a work at depth. It's so much drag. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But then, of course, the other discussion comes along. Well, usually I'm stowing my DPV on my right side or I'm tying it behind me. And so I think they create barriers that really aren't there if they were streamlined. Yeah, absolutely. I agree 100%. They don't know there's a better way out there. You see so few people that are diving that way, even fewer mm -hmm. instructors that are teaching that methodology. Mm -hmm. you know, it's something that for us as cave instructors is paramount. You have mm -hmm. to go into the cave streamlined. You have to go into the cave with your bottles alongside your body. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're open circuit. It doesn't matter if you're on a rebreather. It doesn't matter if it's bailout. If you've got stuff that's floating up behind you, if it's clanging into the ceiling, you're doing damage to the cave. You're impacting both the environment as well as being inefficient with your movements through the water. So for us, we take what's essential and, and absolutely paramount and important to us in the cave, but we take that same mentality and it's adapted to how we dive in the open water and in the ocean, and yep. you end up with a result that works better. So it works great for both environments. Mm -hmm. Now, awesome. Yeah, I just love that. So thank you for sharing because um, I think the more we can get that message across, and it, it does show the benefit for back mount divers of actually doing some training and side mount as well. 
you know, whether yeah. it's side mounting stages, bailouts, deco cylinders, or whether it's actually saying, hey, it might be an opportunity or it might be a dive that side mount makes sense for me. So it'd be good to have that yeah. knowledge. Yeah, I mean, it'd be way easier for us to just strap a stage bottle on our student and say, okay, let's go. Mm-hmm. But instead, we want to spend time with them to get them properly configured and clean and streamlined. And I think that's yeah. part of the reason you see that happening a lot as well, because it's time consuming. Yeah. It's easier to, to rig a standard stage bottle, clip it to your D-rings, and off you go. But, mm-hmm. you know, you're not going to get a quick class from us. You're going to get proper training, and I, we're not going to sign off on you until we're proud to have our name on your card. You know, right. we care. I genuinely care. Like, I don't want to see anything happen to somebody. I want to know that I did everything I could to make them the safest diver possible. Yeah, I hear you. And I think the other thing too is enjoyment of diving. When I finally learned what it meant to be stable in the water, for some people it takes a while and I guess it depends what training you get as well. I got great side mount and initial cave training, but it did take me a while to learn how to be really stable. And once you learn that and you make sure that your equipment's not fighting you in the water, yeah, that's the <laughs> other thing. How can you be stable when your cylinders can move independent oh, of your absolutely. body? You yeah. just can't be. Uh, you might be able to be stable with your head up in the water and feet down, but you certainly can't be stable in trim. Yeah. It makes the dive more enjoyable, right? Yeah. It makes the diver safer. Mm-hmm. There's less impact to the environment. You know, all of a sudden, uh, gas consumption goes down and efficiency mm-hmm. increases and just the overall enjoyment of the dive is just, you know, yeah. you go, wow, there's just the light comes on and, and things click and you go, what an amazing experience when you're fighting equipment, when you're fighting configuration, when you're not set up properly, you don't enjoy it nearly as much. Yeah. And our goal is, is to teach people so that they are having fun, they're enjoying themselves, they're being safe, configured in a streamlined, efficient manner so that they can achieve as much success as possible for them. Yeah, and the enjoyment that comes from that, right, of finally being able Absolutely. to say, hey, yeah, I can why be else stable. Do this yeah. Stuff yeah, exactly. Have fun, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of money to spend to be miserable. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, look, we talked about the Caymans for a second there, and that trip looked amazing, and I, I love the pictures that you took. Tell us a bit about your time there. Um, so we were at, in Little Cayman mm-hmm. uh, this past year for an event called Inner Space, and it was pretty cool. It was the 15th anniversary, mm-hmm. and they had – you know, always previously held it on Grand Cayman. And so they, Cord Dive Tech, which is in Grand Cayman, coordinated the whole event, coordinated bringing sorb and cylinders and trimix and everything over there. And, you know, we were some of the first people to get to dive that deep on the walls in Little Cayman. So it was, mm-hmm. it was pretty amazing. Yeah, it was very, very cool. The size of the sponges, the health of the reef, you know, just really phenomenal stuff. And being able to jump off a boat, the, the reef started at about, three to four meters of depth and descended mm-hmm. down to well over a hundred meters deep. You know, mm-hmm. you're just looking down from a hundred meters and it's just nothing but blue abyss below you. Love um, it. So a fantastic, fantastic opportunity to be able to achieve a little bit of depth, mm-hmm. uh, do it in a nice, warm, clear water, <laughs> yeah. good visibility, currents were mild to non-existent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you, you're doing deco as you're ascending, but you're looking at the walls and you're looking for the sharks and the turtles and the rays mm-hmm. and, and the eels and just all of the marine life that you could enjoy. So you never really feel like you're hanging on deco and just you know, waiting for that moment where you can get back on board the boat. Yeah, yeah and to get 40 rebreather divers together, a lot of them being instructors, you have a, mm-hmm. a really amazing group of people that mm-hmm. are highly experienced. And then some of them are doctors and they're, they're giving presentations in the evenings and, and mm-hmm. you're getting to learn a lot of really awesome things. And it's just a really fun event for, you know, to get together with like-minded people and do some really awesome diving. Very cool. Yeah. You mentioned before about the benefits of being your own boss and working. I mean, travel is obviously one of them. <laughs> and I, I mean, I'm going to go through a list of destinations I've seen you guys in recently, but I, I think I saw you in Abaco not that long ago either. with oh, Brian. Yeah. That was phenomenal. Every time Brian posts a picture or someone posts a picture from there, you know, you see Dan's cave or something like that, I, it just blows my mind. So uh, tell us a bit about your time there. If anyone is listening to this and has even remotely thought about going and, and diving with Brian, going mm-hmm. and diving in the caves over there, they should stop what they're doing right now and, and send him a message and just arrange something. It was absolutely right. phenomenal diving. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, we've, we've known the caves were there. We know Brian is there. We, we've seen the pictures, but... Until you really go and experience it yourself, mm-hmm. pictures and words just don't do it justice. Yeah, mm-hmm. from a distance, you're kind of like, okay, this looks like Mexico, you know, beautiful formations everywhere. And mm-hmm. then you start to swim a little closer and you just realize that everything is crystal. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's stunning. It's, it's all glowing. It's all translucent. Yeah. It's all just 
fine. The roses in the glass mm -hmm. factory. I yeah. mean, so it's just paper thin. Yeah. Uh, Some of the straws. And... We, we spend months every year down in Mexico looking at amazing formations and stalactites, stalagmites, and all, the, all of that. And then to go and, and see similar but even more impressive mm -hmm. things in, in the Bahamas, it got to a point where you would turn a corner <laughs> and, you know, when something is so amazing, your, your jaw kind of You don't even know how to react. Mm -hmm. We didn't you know? know how to react. And I would, just, I would come around the corner and after a while, I would start laughing. And it was just mm -hmm. a spontaneous laugh. But I don't know how else to react to this. It's so, uh, so amazing. So, and, and Brian's a great steward of the caves. He cares yes. so much about the caves. It's, you, know, yeah. you can he tell would, he's very passionate about it. He would explain it. to us you know, how, how the caves there have been dry four different times over the last... 300, 400,000 years. Right. Uh, and you could just see these formations that were growing one on top of the other on top of the other over the, over the time as, as uh, you know, different water levels have come and gone. To see the, the formations there that are unlike anything else. Uh, and then to have him just be so passionate about protecting the environments. And again, side mount would be the right tool for the job down there. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's plenty of cave to, to see in back mounts, uh, but if you really want to see the amazing stuff and really be able to get up close and personal, side mount was the right tool. And, and we were down there with our side mount rebreathers as well. So we yeah, got, the side mount mm -hmm. was awesome for diving cool. there. Plenty of time, no, no stress, not worried about having bubbles and, and not having mm -hmm. to worry about per percolation and silting out and doing any damage to the ceiling from, from that aspect. So uh, absolutely just phenomenal diving. I, I knew that Maybe I knew by the end of the first day. I knew by the end of the second day for sure that we were coming back. Right. And uh, at the end of the trip, when Marissa said, so when are we coming back? <laughs> I just said, I think we've got some free time in October and we are already scheduled to go. Wow. Back. So same, same year, right? Down mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> before we even left. Oh, that's phenomenal. When, when James and I got together, I said to him, I'm like, okay, you, you know, you better have your passport ready to go. Like, where do you want to go? Because I'm just you know, such a believer in traveling and seeing as much of the world as you can and experiencing life and living it to the fullest. And yeah. so I'm always suckering him into planning the next trip and the next spot that we're going and that. pretty much want to go anywhere. So I'm like, okay, where do you want to go? <laughs> if I hint at a location, she'll be signed up for something. <laughs> yeah. Well, what about Orta Cave? Have you thought of there? So Orta, you know, James <laughs> said, oh, I want to go to Orta. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to make it happen. Yeah. So, you know, I contacted the owner of Orta and spoke with him and through messenger on Facebook with translation. And mm -hmm. uh, we booked airplane tickets and uh, spoke to some people that have been there. And then we trying to figure out the dry gloves and, you know, have you oh, caught water just, dive before? No, so I, I have, have. <laughs> no, I, I did some diving in the quarries in Pennsylvania before right. I moved here with dry gloves. But that was like 12 years ago. Yeah. He's never had dry gloves on before in his life. <laughs> yeah. I've got blue gloves and black gloves and brown gloves yeah. and liners and heated liners and rings, and we're going to go and see what happens. I mean, here's the thing. I mean, one of the great things about where you guys live is you can go and fall in the spring somewhere, put all the gear on, and even though it's kind of yeah. hot outside, it's always okay in the water, right? So you can at least oh, yeah. configuration. And I think water is quite a bit colder than Pennsylvania, though, right? No, um, it was, it was um, in the quarries, you hit a major thermocline and it would be yeah. four to, you know, oh, four really? to eight degrees Celsius. So okay. it's about similar temperatures to Orta. So, yeah. you know, that was a long time ago. I think I've kind of like acclimated to the springs temperatures. I, I put dry gloves on my suit a few weeks ago and spent four or five days playing with them. Felt pretty good about it. I think it. the we'll difference see. in Orta will be there won't be a thermocline. There won't be yeah. you know, no, ascending no. and feeling that little bit of warmth, which makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least you're going in summer, right? So you're not yes. breaking through ice and snow to get in there. So that's one. We wonderful. know some people that went in December and it, you know, I've seen I don't video know if I can yeah. handle that. At least you can come out and it'll be somewhat warm on the surface. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Let's talk it because I'm interested in cold water diving. There's a few places I want to go. Orta would definitely be on the list, but there's Bell Island and Newfoundland and places like that and the Great oh, Lakes. Yeah, yeah I was on talk, my list too. Talking to Becky a couple of weeks ago about the Great Lakes and my good friend Pete yeah. Mess runs trips there as well. So that's definitely on the list. And I've dived yeah. down to about eight Celsius. So, and I, I did that in wet gloves. So you're right on the line there Ooh. and that's freezing, but I got away with it. You have to go to dry gloves, heated undergarments as well. Right, we have heated vests and heated yeah, gloves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we have them. We'll yeah. Fingers crossed they work. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. What, what are you actually using? We have a Santee and Light mm -hmm. Monkey heated mm -hmm. vests. Um, Santee makes a heated glove liner. Mm -hmm. So that's 
gloves, you know, that's what pretty much what we have. That's yeah. what we have. That's what we're going with. We have other just regular glove liners just in case. Lots yeah. of fourth element undergarments, Halo, the Arctic, lots of base layers. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Actually, I just got the J2. J2 is super good. I was yeah. really impressed with that. For as thin as it looks, it definitely adds another level of warmth. Yeah, yeah. And that whole expedition thing is really true. You know, I didn't wash it for two weeks. I thought it sounds <laughs> but I just sort of couldn't. And it was fine. You know, it's like yeah. you sort of want to wash it after that period. But it really, it's got the microbiome or something in it that, yeah. that makes sure that, that you can do that. So now I was super impressed with it in Australia. And that's only, we went down to about 12 Celsius. So it's relatively warm there. But it's definitely on my list. I want to go there. <laughs> oh, to Mount Gambia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a really neat place. I'm going to do an episode on it. But look, now that you've asked, it, we can talk about it a little bit. The big attraction there. There's a couple of massive sinkholes that I know that others exist similarly around the world. But thinking of Killsby is one of them, where it's this just big hole in the ground, and and you go down, and then there's blue water um, that goes down to 45, 50 meters at the bottom. You can see all the way across the whole thing, and it was just a really nice little playground to have a start in. But the real attraction there is Tank Cave. It's a similar cave, I imagine, to some of the Florida caves where there's not a lot of formations or anything like that. But the thing with it that I really enjoyed is, number one, it's really beautiful. The water's crystal clear, except around the entry. But the way that they've laid that cave out in terms of the permanent lines is really something I haven't seen anywhere else. Every major tunnel or route has alpha numerically laid out. So they've got every waypoint, every T that has a number. Every passage has an alpha, an alphabetic determination. So when you go down A tunnel, you're going from A to A15. You have a T off to C, and then there's jumps off of C that will go to D tunnels, and then B does a circuit around. And it's really cool from a navigation point of view, and I think it actually adds to safety, to be brutally honest, as well. But the thing that I noticed, I only did eight dives there. And after eight dives, I could recollect virtually all of the T's, where did I go? And I sort of contrast that with some other places I've been where you do a similar number of dives and you're still thinking, gee, okay, where was that jump? How far into the cave was it? Just the ability to be able to remember really well because of the alphanumeric layout was really cool. So I mean, I can look at a map and go, oh yeah, I remember what that looked like. And so, yeah, it is really clever. So I don't know whether that's something other parts of the world can pick up. The Cave Diving Association of Australia have, have laid that out. I haven't seen it in any of the other caves. I'm not sure if they actually do it anywhere else, but Tank certainly has it. And I think it's kind of special in terms of the diving there. The cave itself's got everything, some big wide open passages, ears, lake where there's this massive big open area. And then there's other really relatively tight passages, some of them with really jagged rock formations, other than quite smooth. And so it's got a lot of variety in there too. So I super enjoyed it. Um, we did another one. The other one that really stands out is Engelbrecht's Cave, only because for us, um, it was kind of gnarly. The entry is zero visibility vertically down. Not oh, yeah, I saw your photo. That looks super cool. That's a different one again. That was Baker's Cave coming out, doing the vertical ascent and so on. But Talk cool. about that. He won't go then. Easy piece of cave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, not vertical. Yeah, well, for me, like, I mean, I was struggling because I've got injuries, like shoulder injuries. The only reason we did the ropes course, SRT course, which is single rope technique, was because I got an ear infection. So I was out of the water for, uh -huh. for a day. It actually should have been longer, but it ended up being a day. And my dive buddies were awesome. They said, hey, you know, what can we do? Steve's out of the water, we'll stay out as well. And so uh -huh. we, did a, we did a, oh, they were awesome. We did a ropes course. And so the guys at Reef to Ridge are also do other adventure activities, rock climbing, abseiling, and they specialize in this vertical cave diver certification as well where you ab awesome. yeah you abseil it into a sinkhole uh, maybe sometimes through a really narrow little small hole in the ground that opens up into, into uh, open cave underneath and then you get in the water you keep your climbing harness on you do your dive you come back you, you clip your cylinders onto a rope they pull it up and then you have to climb out and that was the challenging part i stupidly left my harness on and i had lights and reels and weight in it and my dry suit's not light either so i think i was hauling up another 15 20 kilos yeah. out of the cave and it's a tough climb I've done a lot of dry caving uh, in the past i have a rope walker and a frog system and i yeah. i climbed the the biggest pit in the continental us which is fantastic pit and it's almost 600 feet but wow. I've never really, I've never really combined the two. So yeah. seeing that, I'm like, man, I really want to do that. Like combine the two would be really, really cool. Come I don't on. really have many sumps around here. No. So close to 
for the water table. So yeah, well, they have another one called Hell's Hole that we didn't do, and I think that's kind of a sixty meter climb out. Right. That one you saw me struggling on was only fifteen meters, right? So <laughs> this gives you a little idea. Definitely take your harness off next time, but. I think it would have been okay without that. Plus we could have put a foot jammer on, which would have made things a bit easier. So we were sort of definitely at the amateur end of the scale. Certainly not ready for the cave diving group yet, but it was was pretty fun. And and I would love to do that again. And so we'll go back and do it. And my friend uh, Michael Thomas in the UK is now on me about coming over and doing some of the real stuff. So a little bit afraid of that, but still. I think (laughs) Nice. Very cool. That's awesome. So we've been traveling around the world, but I'm really interested in some of the caves that are local to you guys in Fort White there. So what's local and what are your favorite dives? So we're 10 minutes from Jenny Springs, Mm -hmm. which has the devil system. And that's one of the first caves that I dived here. And it's probably still one of my favorites. It's Mm -hmm. got everything. It's got big stuff and small. It's got the wiggly stuff and it's got fossils and I mean, clay banks and you can go and do a 10 hour dive there and go and explore the back. And Mm -hmm. you know, that's only been explored within the last couple of years, or you can spend five hours poking around in the first 500 feet and see a million different places. So Jenny Springs is really close to us here. Mm -hmm. Um, But we're in a really nice kind of central location. If you've been in Mexico, you kind of feel like, Oh, we stay in Tulum a lot when we go there at underworld, you know, we're within a 10 minute drive to like 50 cenotes. Mm -hmm. Here in Florida, everything's a bit more spread out. So there's really no perfect central location. You know, you can be close to one spring one day, but then you might drive 30 minutes another day. You know, we have Ginny right in our backyard. We drive a little bit further. We have Little River, Mm -hmm. uh, Peacock Springs, uh, Madison Blue is is one that I just recently posted some pictures Mm -hmm. of. That's just absolutely stunning cave. It's gorgeous. Yeah, I think the, the thing that most people think about when they first think of Florida cave diving is the high flow. Yes. Uh, for someone that's trained in Mexico, and, and what, what was it like in, in tank cave? Is, is, uh, is so zero, no, nearly zero yeah. flow. Yeah, very minimal. Yeah, nearly immediate. zero flow. So mm-hmm. if you're used to diving a cave like that, or even the, the caves in, in France, I don't think have a whole lot of flow. So we really are known for having high flow caves here. And unfortunately, I think that tends to scare off a few people or at least intimidate folks. And, mm-hmm. and generally what we find is that if someone will come and spend some time with us learning how to understand a flow cave and, and read a cave and be able to stay out of the flow and learn the proper technique time after time after time, someone that's really been in Mexico, uh, often local guides and instructors from Mexico will come and dive with us and they really enjoy the additional challenge of the caves that we have. Yep. They're a little bit deeper on the average. You, you have to contend with the flow a mm-hmm. little bit. You end up with a little bit more deco. You know, you end up having to, or in Mexico, you might throw on a couple of Valley 80s and go swim around for two or three hours. Here, if you want to swim around for two or three hours on open circuit, you're putting on multiple stages to do that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So that the challenge is there. Time after time, I'll have someone that's highly experienced in Mexico come here initially with a little bit of uh, apprehension, trepidation, and then spend a few days with us and really just go, wow, the caves here are really, really super impressive. We have large, we have small, we've got long bore tunnel passages that you can use your scooter and DPV uh, mm-hmm. and scooter through. Uh, and then we've got the small stuff where it's bottle off restrictions and you're wiggling and squeezing through through small stuff. So and it doesn't have to be a high flow cave and, and high flow caves doesn't necessarily mean that the entire dive is you're fighting the flow. You get off the main mm-hmm. passage and you get to some of the side tunnels and you'll find areas that are actually siphoning and you'll find areas that have no flow. Uh, and then we've got some caves that, that don't have flow. Uh, so there's really so, a wide variety. And for someone that wants shallow, we have shallow. Or for someone that wants deep, we, we certainly have deep. For myself personally, uh, Ginny is, is definitely a, a favorite of mine, mm-hmm. but probably number one on my list just because it's, it's near and dear to me and I've done some, some exploration there is Eagle's Nest Cave. And, and most right. people that have heard of Eagle's Nest a number of years ago, I was able to push out an extra uh, about 1,200 foot of cave uh, beyond wow. you know, anything that had been explored in recent history. And just being able to, to get familiar with the cave, uh, depths in the 70 to 80 meters and deeper, doing dives over there that are in excess of 8, 10, 12 hours long. Even the stuff that's been explored is virtually untouched, and then being able to find new virgin cave back there, uh, just absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. And there's nothing more fun than fighting your way to get into Jenny and then turning around. You don't have to work at all. You're just steering with your fins and you can look around and you see so much. And it's mm-hmm. just like, 
you're flying. It's the most yeah. amazing thing ever. I've only done two dives in Devil's Eye and I went there with a local guide and he was awesome actually. And so we got in there. I was that relative. makes a big difference. Yeah, when I go to a new place, I'll do that. To me, it gives you an opportunity to meet someone local, learn the lay of the land and go into a cave where you've got someone who can talk you through how it's going to go in definitely a technique to diving in the flow and if you're going to struggle <laughs> he taught me a big lesson because he explained to me where i should be and on the second dive he allowed me to lead into the cave and so i led in and, and put the primary reel in so it's fun for me and then was swimming in and sure enough i'm swimming in the flow so i wonder where he is and so i have a look back up above you he's right up by the, the, <laughs> by the ceiling yeah. yeah and i think yeah hey, obviously i'm in the wrong place so a lot of people are so used to like don't touch the cave don't touch the cave yeah. Well, now you have to think, okay, when is it appropriate to touch? When is it not appropriate? Where am I able to touch that other mm -hmm. people have touched that I'm not going to impact the cave in a new way? So it can mm -hmm. be really challenging and rewarding from that mm -hmm. perspective too. So it's fun. Yep. Thoroughly enjoyed it. And then I love being in the eye on the way out. We did a bit of deco in the eye and it's just yeah. you know, it's a little small space, but super crystal clear and Provided you can be stable and hang in one place, it's awesome to be in there. And then coming out into the spring afterwards, I remember swimming across back to the deck there with the stair steps where you get out and just thinking how beautiful it was in the spring as well. Yeah. We probably both swam down the run a few thousand times, at, you know, mm -hmm. down to the ear and the eye. If you're the first one there in the morning and it's crystal clear and there's like 30 or 40 turtles, mm -hmm. I mean, it never gets old. Like it never gets boring. It's just, it's breathtaking every time you see it it's beautiful yeah. and i guess the other thing i love about this is particularly with the states is yeah everything's laid on for you there right so you turn up there's a nice little dive shop or the <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. and you know you, you get welcome you come and show your card and then you just go over to the park bench set your gear up and walk down the yeah, steps and you're in the water tank benches and picnic tables oh, it's, totally. it's, it's, val it's valet cave diving. It, doesn't <laughs> it is easy, right it is yeah so, something that i often find that Divers that have dived caves in other places, they've been to Mexico, they've been to France, they've been to Australia. You show up to a, a cave or a dive site there, there might be one or two other cave divers, right? Mm -hmm. You come to Jenny Springs high season on a Saturday afternoon, you'll bump into 20, 30, 40 other cave divers. It's a great way to interact. It's a mm -hmm. great way to share stories. It's a great way to compare and contrast equipment and techniques and thoughts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's, it's often a very interesting uh, experience for someone to come here and just see that the number of other cave divers and technical divers and really have that, that social experience. You yeah, get people yeah. of all ages, people from 10 different countries, people speaking multiple different languages, people that I probably wouldn't get an opportunity to meet or interact with, but now we have this common love for something and it brings yep. us all together and it's amazing, you know, because <laughs> we're in this little tiny town but you get people from all over the world coming here to dive the caves. Yeah, sure. Awesome. And I guess you learn quite a bit too through you know, having more volume there in terms of cave etiquette and, and laying a line such yeah, when there's other divers in there and, and protocols entering and exiting in particular. Yeah, especially with the flow as well. You know, in Mexico, mm -hmm. you're not necessarily worried about keeping the line low to the ground and out of the way and, mm -hmm. and hiding from the flow. But here, if you don't do that, you have to consider you know, that all these divers are going to be getting pushed out and if your line isn't low to the ground and your line isn't tucked off to the side, they're going to get entangled in it and you're going to come back and your line's going to be blowing in the breeze. Mm -hmm. So the whole other aspect of things to think about. And, and that's really good for students too, because they learn, okay, when is it appropriate to do this versus when is it appropriate to do that? And it makes them have to become thinking cave divers, right? which is so yeah. important. Yeah, no, I agree. James, you mentioned that you're involved in some exploration. Marissa, I don't know if you are as well. So talk us through a little bit more about what you're doing or what you have done. In Florida, a much of the easy, much of the, the, the close exploration has been done mm -hmm. years ago. So trying to find anything now that's, that's new or that's virgin is either very quite challenging. You've got to go out and find the sites that don't have the picnic tables and don't have the tank benches. Or you're going to the sites that previously someone got deep in a cave, far back in a cave, and just because of equipment and open circuit constraints, they weren't able to push through any further. Logistically, mm -hmm. it just didn't make sense. And so a lot of the major exploration projects that are happening now are able to happen because of the advancement in technology. Yep. Rebreathers, side mount rebreathers, being able to push further back in a cave. So four-ish years ago, I was uh, swimming around, scooting around in the back of, of Eagle's Nest. I was uh, about 2,500 feet back in the cave. Uh, depths uh, daring 300 feet deep and uh, actually stumbled along into 
uh, a restriction that I, I kind of squeezed through and just through the, through the restriction found the end of the line and found a reel that had been left there over 20 years. There was a very tight restriction in front of me and one that 20 years ago I wouldn't have wanted to pass through with doubles on my back and who knows what gas was being breathed at that point in time. Mm-hmm. But being on a rebreather was like, well, I can take the time and, and I've got the gas and I've got the reserves and I've got the ability to take my time and, and pass through here and passed through a restriction and entered up into another room, continued on, found a few more tight restrictions. It actually ended up being walled out, at, or thinking I was being walled out at a, a jumbo breakdown. Uh, so now about 3,000 feet back in the cave and 290 feet of water. Uh, mm-hmm. And it took me seven or eight more dives going back to that breakdown pile to finally work my way through the breakdown. Uh, and then I actually had to do that with a side mount rebreather. I had to do that with bottles off. I was pushing scooters and pushing bailout and pushing bottles in front of me and wiggling through uh, a vertical crack uh, straight up from about 290 to 270 feet of water uh, with nothing attached to me except for my, my harness and my side mount rebreather, sort of a, a square mm-hmm. peg round hole sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And then broke out to a huge room and just continued on further and further and further. You know, and just being able to, to do that because of the technology and being able to do that because of the equipment, having the time and having the right equipment to be able to do all of that just those are the things that we're able to do now uh, where 10 years ago, even five years ago, you, we wouldn't have had the tools to do those, those sorts of pushes and those sorts of explorations. So right. much of the stuff that's happening uh, in Florida that's, that's sort of noteworthy are, are dives that are in excess of 10, 12, 14 hours long. Guys that are pushing out extreme depths and extreme distances and, and uh, multiple setups and multiple teams that are going in, staging scooters three, 4,000 meters into a cave and doing staging scooters to, to get back is, is yeah. really Sounds amazing. Insane, right? yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. But at the same time, if you're willing to go out and, and sort of hike through the woods and uh, wade through the rivers, you can find cracks that, that haven't been pushed. Uh, a few years ago, Marissa and I were, uh, we, we found a, you know, a hole in the river that had been dived some number of years it's literally before. like a fire hose is being sprayed mm-hmm. in your face. That's how strong the flow is. So nobody, nobody wants to bother with that. It's, you, you got to mm-hmm. find the places that are challenging. Those are the yeah. places that are the left unexplored. It's uh, b- bottle off restrictions. You're completely pushing everything in front of you and you're wiggling through mm-hmm. the fire hose. You're going straight down. James you're- told me that if we got in, <laughs> that, that I would die trying to get out. And so I said, challenge accepted. <laughs> and I was determined to get in. And I eventually got to a spot where I had both bottles off and I'm trying to wedge myself through this tiny hole. And I'm telling him, you know, beforehand, if I cross my legs, you better be ready to yank my butt yeah. out of there. But I like the challenge. I think it's fun. So it's definitely still some exploration to be done, depending upon, you know, what someone's comfort level is, what they're willing to push through, the size of the cave, you know, the equipment configuration and the technology that's available to us. So mm-hmm. still lots of exploration happening in Florida. Yeah, that's awesome. We spent awesome. tons of time hiking through the jungle in Mexico. <laughs> I bet. What I'm finding interesting right now is because Ginny's been dived so much and that you're able to explore the back of that is awesome. But I've spoken to people like Ryan Kitchkoski from South Australia who's diving in Cocklebitty and they did that massive dive in there where they spent four or five days underground, camped in a sump. Yeah. So they were basically fresh enough to explore the back of the cave. So it wasn't so much an equipment thing for them. It was more of a how mentally and physically demanding it is to be that far in a cave and do dives of that duration. So I found that quite interesting. But Ryan also made a discovery in Tank. And Christina Zanato talked about the same thing. It's about looking at caves that have been dived a lot and seeing how they go and then saying, ah, that looks like a passage Mm -hmm. way back there that goes. Maybe this goes as well. And through that, they've been able to discover people have been past there so many hundred or thousand times and never seen it. And they're seeing things that other people have overlooked. And I think that's pretty cool as well. Yeah, absolutely. You can, mm-hmm. Sometimes you can find stuff right in the front that everybody just always swam right past. And mm-hmm. missed it. Yeah, so often someone swims into a cave and they've looked at a map and the map says, go this way. And so they just do. And yeah. all it takes is for that one person to, to go the opposite way or look a different mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. You know, something that was said to me years ago when you're you know, exploring a cave and when you're looking for which way should you go, don't forget to look up. And and so often divers are always looking down, they're looking left, they're looking right. I was in a cave today. I was in an area in Jenny Springs that's not particularly far back in. I got to the end of the traditional line and realized that suddenly there was a line going straight up that hadn't been there two years ago. And I looked up and there was a hole in the ceiling and there was some going tunnel. And Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of young guys that just 
within the last few months and, and found this and they happened to be back there and one of them must have looked up. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's all about having the right mindset and using, you know, all of your senses and looking around and not just assuming that, you know, what someone told you was walled out 20 years ago is necessarily true. Yeah, and no, that's exciting. And you're quite right. I mean, I had an experience diving the Pines Cave, and which is a nice cave too. And it's kind of the entry there. You enter from a beautiful pool and it's a bit like Florida. You've got nice steps come down and everything's nice and easy. And so you get yourself in the water and the entrance is definitely, you can't get in there in a twin set very easily. So it's a side mount cave, even though they're not really restrictions, but it looks like it's a big rock fall and the rocks have fallen in a particular shape and you can swim through this passage and I was putting the primary reel and only my second dive in there and I took a wrong turn. And the reason I did is because it looked like the cave went on and maybe it does. It was only because the guy behind me was pulling my fin and said, no, we have to go this way that I came back. So I'm laying line into a new <laughs> cave there. Nice. It did start to get pretty tight. I thought, oh, maybe this is wrong. <laughs> but it's interesting how that happens, I am. And that was on a right angle bend that I should have taken. So I think a couple of things I learned there is number one, yes, the cave can go on in directions that you hadn't seen before. And number two, when you are putting a line and pay attention, I had missed a turn that I should have found. And so kind of a cool experience. nonetheless. <laughs> and when you make a mistake, you learn something from it. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, look, we've been an hour and unfortunately I'd love to go on. I've got to hard stop myself. I'm off diving this weekend and I've got to leave in about half an hour. I've really, really enjoyed catching up with you both and I appreciate your time. I would have liked to talk more about rebreathers. So let me get this in real fast. So you mentioned that you guys dive Kiss Sidewinder. I know you, was at the Liberty as well? That yeah, so we're both instructors on the Sidekick and the Sidewinder mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. as the, the Side Mount SF2. Mm -hmm. And then I just, just got a Liberty and just got certified on that. So I'm going to gain hours and experience on that with the yeah. intentions of becoming a Liberty instructor. Because, you know, each of those units has different things to offer. And there really no, isn't the perfect rebreather out there or that would be the one that we're all diving. So right. you really have to look at what you're trying to accomplish and mm -hmm. what you're looking for and what's most important to you in a rebreather. And then from there, you can kind of make a choice of which one makes the most sense. So I just want to kind of be able to offer those different choices. And also, it's valuable for me to have the experience to then be able to pass it along to other people as well. Yeah. So some of them excel in, in sumps because they're lightweight. And some of them excel mm -hmm. at depth because they're electronic. And some of them just excel because they're simpler and easier to use. So they all have their pros and their cons. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think we're both rebreather junkies. You know, we, yeah. we love diving. <laughs> we love cave diving. We love yeah. getting inside now. But at the same time, we also love the technology and, and, and just the, and the learning. Toys. I love learning, learning mm -hmm. something new, challenging myself. That's why I took up photography, you know, not yeah. that long ago because it's like, oh, this is a new way to push myself, to challenge myself. And then I just fell in love with it. So, yeah. You know, and I think especially when you're in the water as much as you guys are, right, it's kind of always looking for something new. And I love that. And looking back to what we spoke about in the beginning where you like to sell what you use. But now you're looking at a range of rebreathers. Are you saying there that you would dive a different rebreather for different dives? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yep. There's a different tool for different jobs. It right. depends what you're trying to accomplish. Right. Yep. We stay proficient with all of them. We, we dive mm -hmm. all of them. Again, depending upon the cave, whether it's deep, whether it's big, whether it's small, whether it's something you've got to push and, and grind through. And each one of these different units has its own particular benefits and, and pros. Some, Some are really great for travel, really compact mm -hmm. and easy to travel with, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, and for as avid of a side mountain diver as I am, when I'm going to Eagle's Nest and doing a 10 or 11 hour dive, and I know I need to carry seven or eight bottles, mm -hmm. it's not, side mount doesn't necessarily make the most sense in that case. I'm still side mounting something. I'm side mounting my bailout, but it might be easier for me to have the rebreather on my back, side mount big steel bailout bottles and then be able to clip off a bunch of additional bottles mm -hmm. where with a lot of the rebreathers, you're taking one side of your body up without bottles, but instead of rebreather. And now it becomes that much harder to manage all those bottles. Sure. So if the cave requires a side mount rebreather, then that makes sense. But mm -hmm. otherwise there's some times where it just makes more sense to put the rebreather on your back and side mount your bailout. So, yeah. you know, different yeah. tools for different jobs for sure. Interesting. Well, that sounds like we could do another whole episode on that. So I think we'll come back. And as you yeah, know, I'm, I'm coming to Florida in September and I don't know if we'll get a chance to catch up. I'll be in Mariana with Ed doing Sidewinder training, but I'm super excited about that. And it will be at cave camp. That's something else I really want to go to because I know Gary Dallas and I'd love to come over and have it's a look at this. It's so much fun. Mm -hmm. Getting all the cave divers together. Everybody's super mm -hmm. passionate, excited about it. Underworld yeah. is amazing. Lanny and Claire are awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
you can't ask for a more amazing event. Plus, you can win like a Shearwater computer, you can win an XX right. Ray, an Otter dry suit. Like, who doesn't want to win one of those things? And the event just paid for itself for you. So, it's oh, pretty, exactly. Pretty amazing. Lots of puppies to play with if you like puppy dogs. <laughs> and there's some cave diving as well. Okay. On top of all of that. It's also yeah. for me. It's the challenge of being on completely the opposite side of the world. So to get to the states in Europe is a big deal, and so yeah. but having said that, it sounds so amazing. So we're lucky. We're an hour and a half flight. You can just about swim there, so, couldn't we? Yeah. yeah, we're down there two or three months out of the year. We run yeah. trips down there. We do guided guided trips and take groups mm -hmm. down there as well as that's where we go for our own vacations. Yeah. So you know, definitely a, yeah. a great place to be. Awesome. Well, look, not this year, but another time I'll get over to you guys as well. And if you yeah, ever get to this part of the world, uh, cave diving's tough in New Zealand. So you've got to be prepared <laughs> to, uh, to really go to cold water and also go to some pretty remote areas as well to find anything that's, that's great. But that is awesome. I haven't done it myself yet, but maybe in the future. But certainly uh, if you get over to go to uh, Mount Gambier or something, maybe I could join you yeah. there. So. I love cool. that. Very cool. Right. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks again. Enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Cheers. Have a good night. Bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to that episode as much as I did making it. It was fantastic to catch up with Marissa and James and learn more about their approach to side mount and cave diving. Just a couple of notes in closing. If you're looking for more information on side mount diving, my ebook Side Mount Fundamentals is available through my website www.sidemountpros.com in the store. And also next year, June 2020, we have our bucket list trip to Truck Lagoon with Pete Mesley's Lust for Rust. More information on that is available through my website under the calendar tab. Thanks again for joining us and see you on our next episode. You've been listening to Speaking Sidemount from www.sidemountpros.com. If you like the podcast, please subscribe and consider leaving us a five-star review. If there's something you'd like us to cover on the show, then let us know via our Facebook page listed in the podcast notes. Thanks again, and we look forward to you joining us on our next episode of Speaking Sidemount.